production of Detroit Black Journal is made possible in part by a grant from the men and women of Mishkan. Detroit Black Journal, you're on the air. Hello, I'm a University of Detroit student. Hi, this okay. is Susan. I heard what you just said, and I just well, wanted to talk to you. My name is Bill Harris. Right. I, I have a question. You're right. right. And I'd like to respond to Thanks that. Thanks again. I think that's mythological. Live from the studios of WTBS, Detroit Black Journal proudly continues its award-winning years of history, news, and current affairs from a black perspective. Good evening, I'm Ed Gordon. For the last few years, particularly during the winter months, you've heard about the plight of the homeless. You've heard that the stereotyped skid row bums are only a small segment of the homeless population and more and more families have come upon hard times and cannot afford shelter. Now the homeless are becoming more vocal. <laughs> Last Monday, on the Martin Luther King holiday, members and supporters of the National Union for the Homeless entered empty units at the Brewster Douglas Housing Projects, claiming the city has livable vacant units, while 27,000 are homeless. These places would be like this with all this heat, all of us go out and let's show. All this crime. The group was eventually escorted out by police, and four people were arrested. With us tonight are Maureen Taylor. She is the acting chair of the Support Committee for the Homeless Union and was one of the people arrested last week. Sonia Terry is homeless and currently lives at the Cotts Shelter. Councilwoman Marianne Mahaffey attended last week's protest and says the city is not doing enough to help the homeless. Also, we were uh, looking for the City of Detroit Housing Director Thomas Lewis to be with us uh, this evening. He called... Uh, Oh, about six o'clock and said that he would not be able to appear with us this evening and uh, we're sorry about that. So let us go on from there and talk about uh, some of the problems that we're, we're faced. As we mentioned at the outset, you have begun to hear about the homeless in the last few years. Uh, Oprah Winfrey did a show this afternoon. NBC did a special uh, Friday, Friday night uh, prime time. Uh, a number of articles, stars sleeping out, uh, political figure sleeping out. The homeless, though, as we mentioned, has changed. What kind of uh, people are we talking about in the city of Detroit who are out on the streets? Uh, Ms. Well, we're talking about several. We're talking about a much different population. It used to be that the homeless were primarily single men who maybe had an alcoholic problem. Nowadays, we find nationally as well as in Detroit that close to 50% of the homeless are families. Uh, we figure that there are anywhere from 15,000 to 27,000 people who are homeless in Detroit during the year. One of the problems in getting an accurate count is that an awful lot of people live with friends and relatives and never show up in the shelters as they move from one friend or relative to another. Uh, we know that recently there's been an increase. The most rapidly increasing group has been single fathers who are heads of families, namely men with children. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a percentage of people who are in need of transitional housing, someone who's completed a drug or a substance abuse program, someone who has a mental health problem, an ex-convict, uh, disabled. We have a need for shelter for people who uh, need like uh, a home away from home. Mm -hmm. But our biggest and most severe problem is the problem of the families and their problem and many people's problem results from the fact that we do not have enough decent housing that is affordable for low-income people. And that's why the plan of the city to tear down 1,037 units at Brewster Douglas mm -hmm. and replace them with 250 is really an abomination, especially since the federal government, Congress, has just adopted $1.7 billion, the highest amount ever for repair and rehabilitation of public housing. And that, in fact, is what 
what you all were protesting about uh, last week. Let me, before I ask your story, uh, Sonia, remind the people at home I did not I neglected to, but there's a number on the bottom of the screen. Please, we'd like to hear from you tonight. 872-4040 is the phone number. Tell us uh, about your story. Why, why are you in a shelter? Um, I was working earlier, it's the early part of uh, 87, and the company I worked for transferred to Pontiac. Shortly thereafter, um, I sought other employment. Um, there wasn't too much going on. I couldn't draw unemployment because I hadn't been working any period of time. Now, I was staying on the northwest side of Detroit. Um, I left there, moved in with my family. And from that point on, I mean, you know, when you're with family, you do try to get your own, you know. So I did seek employment. I, didn't, I got a little painting job here and there, but nothing to really hold the rent or pay the rent. So I just was from one household to another, one friend to another, back and forth to family. Until finally, uh, where I was staying at, uh, got very heavy into drugs and I had to leave, so. Well, let me see if I can ask you some of the questions that certainly you've heard before and there are some people I'm sure who sit back and I think it's coming closer to home because uh, especially in a city like Detroit where you see countless numbers of people being laid off who thought that they were set for life and in fact that very next day, boom, you're out on the street, you may be able to pay rent for one or two months, but you can't. But there were going to be people who sit there and say, hey, there have been hard times before and people have got along and maybe you're not trying as hard as you should be. What do you say to people like that? Well, there's a few things I could say, but I guess being polite, um, <laughs> you can only, okay, like in my, in my case, I'm, I'm a veteran, okay? Um, you do have government jobs available, but if you are not skilled in a specific area, you have to go through some type of training process. Um, as far as your factories and layoffs through factories and what have you, if you've never worked a factory job before, it's not going to be an easy thing to get your foot in the door in that case. Nobody wants to take a minimum paying job. You know, I'm 28 years old, I'm expecting a baby. I can't support myself and a child on a minimum wage job. Um, it's difficult to get on aid, you know. Um, give me a job, you know. Uh, give me some incentive, give me some job training. Okay. okay. In fact, you're hearing a lot of this same thing, are you not? Every day, every day. The problems are gone. It, it, it's just a monumental catastrophe that's going on, and the uh, public needs to wake up to the fact that uh, people like Sonia are veterans. Uh, it just makes no sense. Individuals that have spent time in the government and the armed, armed services of this country and whatnot have to come out and live in shelters. In her particular case, and she's not alone, uh, she's at the Cots shelter and she's going to be there for a limited amount of time. And she's on the short end of that time now. In the next few days, she has to find other lodgings. And as of this point, we question her about that today. She doesn't have uh, access to another facility. Let, let, so, me, let me see if I can pick up on something that you uh, said, Mrs. Mahaffey, and I'd like both of you ladies to address it. You were out at the Brewster Douglas uh, projects saying that we've got so many people out on the street. There are a number of vacant units here. Why not let them in? Let me sit on the other side of the table mm -hmm. and say, okay, you let these people in. They still don't have a job. They're not going to be able to upkeep this place. What is that going to do to the resident who's already in Brewster Douglas? Okay, uh, Ed, there are a couple things. There is no um, paperwork that we can find that says that if a person moves into uh, the uh, Brewster Douglas projects that they will not be able to maintain an apartment. Our position is very, very simple. There are at least a thousand units. They are heated. As on the way down here today, we pass them. The lights are on inside of boarded up buildings and taxpayers are paying for this kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to move people that have a need for a roof over their heads into these facilities. So you're At saying that, simply well, let me because finish. I'm on a roll now. All right. After we get people inside these buildings, then we will work out the, the necessary details so that they will be able to maintain roofs over their head, which means the training. All those things come forward. Now at COTS and the rest of the shelters, the people don't come in to try to give the residents inside the shelters any kind of job training. Those things are made available. But if we could at least assure a roof over a person's head, then we can move on to the next step. Okay. 
uh, Mr. Mahaffey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to answer that also. But what we'd like to do now, we have a, a young lady on the phone who is a uh, resident of the Brewster Douglas Projects and also with the Detroit Housing uh, Commission. She's a commissioner there, Lena Bivens. Uh, hi, Lena. Are you with us? I am. Uh, you've heard what was just said here, uh, did you not? Yes, I did. What, what do you think about that? Uh, I think that uh, neither one of the ladies have been told how you enter the projects, any project, not only Brewster, any project. You must, by federal law, apply. On Chrysler Drive, they have a placement. Whatever housing development you go in, you put in an application. That application and that manager there do not place you. You must go to, your application must go to placement. They must interview you. Then you have certain papers you must bring in. Uh, okay, L let me see if I can, uh, I can cut you short there and just ask you, is it your concern that people aren't going through the right procedures or are you afraid that if you open this housing up to anybody, you don't know who you're gonna get as a neighbor? Not afraid of opening up to anybody. Those units that they saw would like to heat in have already been spoken for. We've met with the mayor in the Brewster project and we worked out a plan for the rehabilitation of Brewster which moves the people from south end of Brewster Douglas to the north on Brewster Douglas till they refurbish one end okay. and move them back. Okay, stay with me. You want to say No. Something? Yes, I think there's a lot that needs to be said. Number one, these are, this is federal housing, and there are, uh, there are requirements relative to income. You can't be above a certain income level and live there. You do have to apply. There is a screening process. However, uh, the city is still planning to tear down 1,037 units. Brewster Douglas now is a 55-acre uh, project. Uh, if those plans go through to tear down 1,037 and have and erect 250 new ones, there will be uh, something like only 20, uh, 20 of those 55 acres will be in use for public housing. You the federal government also has made it very clear that public housing can be used for homeless people. And once someone moves in, there is the, there is the chance then, not only chance, but there is the reality of working out an arrangement with public aid. And in public housing, one pays only 30% of one's income. So for example, a person who's on disability and a single person and gets $300 a month would pay only $30 for rent. And one of the problems today is that there is not enough decent housing out there in the community you do that understand people can afford. Her concern, though, do you not? I can, well, the <laughs> let me put it this way: you will, because of the standards and requirements of public housing, there will not be. Uh, people moving into Brewster who will be dangerous to the people who already live there. Secondly, the city is still planning to tear down 1,037 units. The city council has approved a contract with a firm mm -hmm. that has analyzed and done the uh, preparation for repairs in housing projects in Washington, D.C., and in Boston, and they've looked at Philadelphia, and they tell us that Detroit's Brewster Douglas project is not only the same, but better than a lot yes. of the public housing in Boston, as well as in Washington and Philadelphia. Yeah. And therefore, it's a shame to tear down a thousand units yeah. when we desperately need When it. our office talked to Tom Lewis earlier this week, he said that roughly 40 people wanted to live in Brewster. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, no, I have to I have to speak to that's that. That's ridiculous. One of the problems has <laughs> been that the shelters have given up referring anyone Thank to you. Brewster Douglas because they have been told by housing that there are no vacancies. Exactly. And that's because a couple of years ago they decided to tear down a thousand units and they began to board them up. Okay. In addition, the tenants at Brewster Douglas located over 400 people who were interested in the possibility of living in Brewster Douglas. The housing department has not followed up on any of them. And there's one final thing that has to be said about this. Okay. People have gone on to ask for applications to go into Brewster Douglas and been told there are none. Okay, so uh, what I want to do now, and I hope that we can keep Lena with us, we'll come back to her. 
we'll go around this question some more. We want to get the people at home involved now. Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. Yes, I'd like to direct my question to Ms. Mahaffey, Councilwoman Ms. Mahaffey. Go ahead, please do. And the question is, what is the city of Detroit doing about the local housing problem? She has spoke very briefly about the federal housing. What is the city of Detroit doing, for instance, in Herman Garden and other public projects around the city of Detroit? That we have already allocated monies and the money has been spent. Okay. The projects are still in the... the, the uh, uh, well, they're in let's, very poor condition. Okay, yeah. let's give her right, a chance. Look, millions of dollars have been put into Herman Gardens, uh, and it has been modernized, and there are units that have been torn down. But one of the problems is the marketing strategy has been pretty miserable, and so there are still vacancies there, and that's why the city council has let this contract for a, an outside firm to come in and not only give us the actual cost of what it would uh, uh, what would be required to repair the units at Brewster Douglas, but also to develop a marketing plan. And if there is full cooperation with the city, this could be ready for the March 4th deadline okay. for Detroit to get in on some of that $1.7 billion. Okay. I don't want to get too far away from the entire issue yeah. of homeless, because at that point we're yeah. talking about mm -hmm. people who have homes and we're trying yeah. to do something. So I hope that answers your question. Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. Yes, I would like to say I'm, I'm homeless and running from one relative to another, and I have called down there to the low income down at Chrysler, and they told me to call back the end of February, and I need a place very bad, so what am I to do? Okay, you want to take Yes, that? I can answer that already. Uh, Councilwoman Mahaffey, I thought she was quite eloquent. We could almost end the program because there's nothing else to say. Uh, Ms. Bivens, and I hope she is still on the line because she must be living in a rose-colored world. She needs to come out of the office and look a little bit more carefully. I called Brewster Douglas today to get information on what the situation was about filing applications. And I was told that there's a waiting list, a lengthy waiting list, if you can get an application at all. So what does so this young what, woman do, though? What does she needs to do at this point? She needs to call and join the homeless union because the only way for folks to be able to get involved and try to figure out where they're going to get houses, they have to be able to be in an organization that is prepared to negotiate for houses, for shelter, for food, and education and whatnot. She should call the homeless union. Well, let me union. ask you, Sonia, what has the union done for you? Mm. The union has, uh, for one thing, instilled some dignity back in myself. You know, when you're homeless, you're not helpless, but you have a tendency, after going to such places such as social services, to start feeling like, you know, well, nobody cares. You know, your family can only do so much. You're an adult, okay? You're, you're living out here, you're, you're striving for something. The union does instill some dignity, some pride, um, from what they've offered, it has also helped me to see that there's nothing wrong with me. Okay. Okay. There's nothing wrong with me. My biggest problem is getting up doing something for myself. And that's what myself and other homeless people have to do. You can't expect someone to give you something. So it's a good support system. It really is. Okay. Back to the I, phone lines. I would suggest that that lady also file an application, even though they tell her that uh, well, you if know, they tell her no and, and don't give her one. Get one no I'm you saying know? she should continue to go I think she should go to the homeless union I'm okay. all in favor of that but I'm saying at the same time she ought to send a letter that puts it in writing that she wants a unit in public housing and then she ought to send she ought to as I said be in touch with the mm -hmm. homeless union and she ought to also let a council member have a copy of that letter that goes down to public so housing. she can send it to you that's right. Okay, back to the phone lines. Hi, you're on DBJ, go ahead. Yes, um, I'm a single person and I'm very low income and I applied down in housing and they turned me down because they said I wasn't a family. I wanted to ask Ms. Mahaffey, what, I mean, why is that I, I either have to be married or have children to be eligible to live in the projects? Well, there has been a federal rule that only a certain percentage of public housing can be for single people. Uh, the city did, after a great deal of pushing from the council, get that uh, percentage increased. It used to be something like 15%. Uh, it seems to me that, again, you ought to be in touch with the homeless union. Yes. You also get, ought to get your name and information to me because we need to continue to push because I'm not sure that uh, it, I think it would be possible to get even more of the units made available, a larger percentage, for single people. Okay. But we need your help to do it. Okay. 
Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, this is for Ms. Mahaffey, that uh, the Seven Up company that is going that is going to, through this trial period right now, and they're going to dismiss all these employees. Uh, I was just wondering if they had any comment from the city to try to negotiate something with these people or to help these people because they're going to be put out on the street. And I was put out on the street after working 10 years at a place and had to start all over again. Well, it's a continuing question of companies coming in and just laying off people w without notice. W without notice, with no provision for uh, services so that people know where to go and what's, what the benefits are that they're eligible for. And I can only say to you that in that instance, if it happens to you, if you're a union member, get to your union. Uh, if you're, uh, and also uh, get to someone like one of the council members. We can oftentimes make referrals based on knowing your specific situation. Let me ask you, there has been though, if a layman looks at it and looks at just the dollars being pumped in from government money in the last couple of years, there's been a fairly decent amount of money when you juxtapose it with, with other problems in the United States put into the homeless issue in the last couple of years. What do you tell a person beyond the humanity question, okay? What do you tell a person who says, well, why should I really care? Uh, this issue of homelessness affects us all. If you do not pay for this and work at this issue and address it today, you will certainly have to address it next week. The young man that just got off the air, he raised it better than I ever could. This has to do with a question of private property, which is identical to what the project situation is about. 7-Up decided that they needed a certain kind of money in their pocket, so Friday morning, without notice, we're going to put a note on your locker to tell you you no longer work here. There's no more messages or anything involved. There's no The question of humanity it goes beyond that because all of the persons that were laid off or fired or whatever it's going to end up being, what, what are they going to do? The domino effect is in effect again, but it's the same thing at the Brewster Douglas projects. If you don't have, if she doesn't have a house, if she doesn't have a job, if she doesn't have a, whatever it is she needs, the money and whatnot to transfer to exchange for shelter, then it's all right for her to sleep on the top of a van at Cobo Hall. And it's ludicrous, and that's what we have here. All of this is an issue has to do with whether or not basic blue-collar people have control over their lives. Mm -hmm. And these are just two very perfect indications that we do not. And there's uh, not enough money. Oh. Not enough money. Okay, what I want to do here, I want to ask you something. I want to see if we can check to, to see if uh, Ms. Bivens is still on the phone with us. She is. We'll get to her in just a minute. How do you feel in a shelter? Uh, we've heard a lot of things about shelters being unsafe sometimes. Um, is, is COTS the only shelter you've been in? It's the only first and hopefully last. But you've certainly <laughs> talked to people who've been in a number of shelters. What are people's thoughts on shelters uh, they hate as a whole? Them. They hate them. Why? Because, um, one, it's not home, okay? Uh, um, security is there to protect you, uh, to keep. You have some mothers that are there that are running from husbands or boyfriends. It's a crowded environment. You have no peace of mind. Uh, you talk to in such a nature and such a tone at times that uh, makes you feel less than human. But we should say that you, you've been treated fairly at Cots. She lives there, and see, it's an unfair no, question. No, 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 she lives there. Though. Wait a no, she's got to go back to Cots tonight. I'll so say this. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. She's got to go back to Cots tonight. So if she says she's been treated unfairly. The question becomes whether or not we are prepared to manage it if they tell her to leave in the morning. And that's how serious this is. She had to get permission to leave tonight. Mm -hmm. You can't come and go as you want to. So she sits here this evening and says, well, no, I'm treated unfairly. And she goes back to Cots. And they decide, well, listen, you said those bad things about us on television. So the first thing in the morning you leave, then what kind of predicament are we in? That's why we have to get people into independent housing. Because the question you ask is a good one, but she's in a fix if she answers. Okay, I tell you, my time is running. I want to get Mrs. Bivens back on. Very briefly, uh, Mrs. Bivens, you've heard what's been said. Why not let these people in? They don't have anywhere to go. Some of those houses uh, can provide shelter. Let me state this. I think the young lady in the middle said that, you know, I'm removed from life, uh, from the world, work world, or whatever you want to call it. I want every one of you to know that I have lived through what they have and something worse than that. But I'd like to say 
concerning the young lady to my right is that, uh, and from Mary Ann Mahaffey, I think all of the phases of government need to come together to work on this problem together. It's a social problem. It is not no one person's problem. It's, it's all the social status and all of these people who look down on these people. We in the project don't look down on anybody. We only can follow government policy and rule. And okay. I believe that, I'm that Terry, that Miss Terry there, that she is the government's responsibility if she spent one day in the service. And I think the government ought to see that she get enough money to live wherever she wants to. Thank you. She came into the public housing with her uh, uh, income and treated like a human being after serving this country. Okay. She can move in. And the other young lady, I have been in more organizations than you ever dared to shake a stick at, and I have been exposed to much more than all. Oh, okay, I've got, I've got to wrap you up there. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, it very much, ladies. Certainly nothing we're going to solve this evening. Now here's Susan Watson with commentary. You don't have to be a bum or a wino or a crazy person to be homeless. You just have to be unlucky. And that's the hard truth that most of us with roofs over our head don't want to face. A string of bad luck can do it to you. A factory shuts without notice, leaving hundreds of people without jobs. Cutbacks in a large company force an executive out the door. The furnace goes kaplooey in a rundown house, or the house catches on fire, and there you are. The family is out on the street. Or your landlord stops understanding that you have to feed and clothe the kids before you pay the rent, and out you go. It has happened to folks just like us. Being a good, decent person has almost nothing to do with it. About 40,000 people in Detroit and more than a million people in the United States are homeless. And one third of them are children. Are they bad, worthless people? Of course not. But with government cutbacks and corporate restructuring, almost no one, black or white, well-to-do or poor, city dweller or suburbanite, is safe from the possibility of being homeless. It's just that some of us are luckier than others for now. Thanks very much, Susan. I appreciate it. 833-7730 is the phone number for the Homeless Union if you want to uh, call them. Join us next week as we look at the increasing number of uh, racism incidents in our country here. That's all for tonight. We close with Miss Stephanie Mills and a song called Home. We'll talk to you next Monday. Good night. Detroit Black Journal is a live television production of WTVS Channel 56. The opinions expressed on Detroit Black Journal are those of the participants and not necessarily those of the staff and management of Channel 56. When that makes the tall grass bend into leaning, suddenly the raindrops that fall have a meaning. Production of Detroit Black Journal is made possible in part by a grant from the men and women of Mishkan.